Hi, welcome back to Crimes and Closets. This is Beth coming at you from a closet in North Carolina. Hey, this is Christy in my closet in St. Louis. <clears throat> or St. Louis. 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 <laughs> I can't even, I don't even know how to say it anymore. <laughs> if you haven't listened to the episode about the Italians, please go back. <laughs> How's it going over there? Oh, it's going. That's, that's, uh my response every single time it's just going <laughs> right nothing new in the hood except maybe i have seen slightly more people like you know out and about you know just like i met somebody for lunch for the first time last week which was fun but not the same because so it's empty and just different yeah so. i know i hear you and this mandatory mask business it's just all getting wackier and wackier yep yeah. So how about you? How's it going there? Yeah, it's good outside my closet. We um, took a little hike today and um, with some of our neighbors and their kids that we're friends with, some mom friends of mine. And we went to this place and it had like a little creek and the kids were all playing in the creek. And then we saw snakes Ugh. and yeah, swimming. Is there anything creepier than a snake swimming? No. no. And it was a copperhead because there was this other like snake expert woman there apparently who confirmed that it was a baby copperhead. And so like mama was coming around and, you know, my kids were for the, we were like, get out of the water, stay away from the edges. Don't go around anything that looks like a hole or sticks or whatever, <laughs> you know, like these, you know, fallen trees and stuff where they could all hide and. My littlest one is just like prodding the snake with his stick and I mean, <laughs> standing so close, right? I mean, he's so cute, but like, God help me, this child, he has no sense of self-preservation whatsoever. And like, I truly, like he'll do stuff and I'll be like, why did you do that? And he's like, I just wanted to see what happened. Like, that's literally his answer at five years old. And I'm like, I believe you. Like, you are crazy. And so we're all standing around talking about how he's, like, such a daredevil and so crazy and keeps poking the snake and trying to fall off the edge of the rocks. And one of the ladies, like, one of the moms was on her phone. And she's like, oh, my gosh, he is so annoying. And I was like, right? Right? <laughs> he's so annoying, right? And she was like, oh, no, somebody text me. I was talking about the person that texts me. I was like, <laughs> oh, right. Yeah, that's what I thought you meant. I didn't think you were I calling know. my own, my kid annoying. I did not agree. I'm a good mom. <laughs> clink, clink, clink. <laughs> that's right. Nobody got bit. We're fine. Right. So I have a uh, crime story for you. Really? I thought we were talking about... Um, I don't know. Family matters today. <laughs> no? We can. I can't. I mean, like, okay. you got more time. I got more matters. Yeah. Um, <laughs> I'm telling you a crime story today about two ladies Ooh. named uh, Gwendolyn Graham and Kathy Wood. Do you know them? No. Mm -hmm. Okay. You're about to know them. I'm excited. Okay, I'm going to start with Miss Kathy. Okay, Catherine May was born in Michigan in 1962. Her mother was very absent and her father was very abusive mm. and she had a very difficult upbringing, according to Kathy. So in 1979, when Kathy was 17 years old, she met a boy by the name of Ken Wood. And Kathy allowed herself to get pregnant. Purposefully? Is that what you're I saying? Mean, that's what I feel like that means. Okay. And she says that it was in order to get out of her abusive home. So this okay. was her escape from her parents' home, and opportunity, I guess, to start a new life, her own life. Because at that time, if you're pregnant, you probably better be 
with the man. Yeah, so this is 1979. So her and Ken got married, and ha- she had a daughter that she named Jacqueline. So her name is Jackie Wood. And Ken, her husband, says after the baby was born that Kathy never really bonded with her, the baby. She was very withdrawn, and she seemed, like, kind of irritated that she even had to take care of this baby. Mm -hmm. And, yeah, so she's a stay-at-home mom while he's working, and she just kind of became very isolated, and she never went anywhere. She really, like, let herself go and actually ended up... Um, weighing about 450 pounds. Stop. And, oh, okay, but, well, I mean, that's a lot. But, like, Kathy's, like, six feet tall. So she's not, like, a petite lady. But still, yeah, 450 Mm -hmm. pounds. Okay. And she let their house get really dirty and cluttery and, like, just everything became filthy and awful. And Ken was really, like, over the years, started to get super, super concerned about her And he suggested that Kathy go and get a job. Like, go get a job. Our daughter is older. This was in 1985. And their daughter was, you know, going to school. So he said, you need to go get a job. Get out of the house. Make yourself feel better. So at this time, Kathy was 23 years old. So she's so young. Like, gosh. And she began working as a nurse's aide at Alpine Manor Nursing Home in Walker, Michigan. Okay. Okay. So at this nursing home, there was a lot of women who worked there as nurses, aides, and front desk people and, you know, so forth. And Kathy actually became very attached and was very welcomed by a small group of women who were extremely tight-knit who were lesbians that worked in the nursing home. And she really bonded with these ladies. And she found... Something that she felt like in her life she was missing, missing out on, like that missing piece. And she started hanging out with them all the time. Um, There's unconfirmed rumors that she had some affairs with some of the women. She started taking care of herself. She lost a bunch of weight. Um, She was going out to bars. She was partying. She was becoming super, super distant from her husband and her daughter and just kind of immersing herself in a new life with a new job and her new friends. Okay. So Ken also, you know, is obviously concerned about this and doesn't love it. And he starts to notice that Kathy is becoming extremely manipulative and like purposefully causing fights between them but like crazy fights. Like she would have her friends call the house and say that they were Ken's ex-girlfriends. And then she would yell at Ken about it. Like your ex-girlfriends are calling my house and saying crap to me. And he's like, I literally have no idea who this person is. Like, I don't know what you're talking about. So it's like, it was crazy. She just kind of said, like she was causing all these really passive aggressive fights about all kinds of things. Like that's just one example. And in the summer of 1986, after seven years of marriage, Ken was like, bye. Mm. Like, I want a divorce. I don't even know what your deal is. We can't do this anymore. And he takes Jackie and lives, takes her. And she lives with him. Okay. And oh. and Kathy's fine. Kathy? Sorry. Kathy <laughs> is like. She's fine with that. She's, she's totally fine with it. Yeah, exactly. Okay. So I'm going to fast forward a little bit and I'm going to tell you this because I think it's important about Kathy as the story goes on. Later on in Kathy's life, not long after, but later on, she was diagnosed with a psychological disorder called pathological narcissism. Okay, so I'm going to put on my little psych hat for a minute. Mm -hmm. I was going to say, I don't know what that means, but this is my happy place. Okay, (laughs) so this is a disorder that commonly has a very distorted sense of self-importance or in a person's own ability. So like you think you do everything better than everybody else, that you are better than everybody else, that you're entitled, you're above the rules. Um, You kind of see people as extensions of yourself, if that makes any Mm -hmm. sense. So like Mm -hmm. no one else is really their own person, really how they behave and the things that they do are a reflection of you. 
because they're just jealous of you. Oh. And so this makes a person with this disorder have a very a huge lack of empathy. And it makes them very controlling because they think like, well, you can't act like that because I'm friends with you and that's not how I want people to see me. Hmm. Or, you, you know what I'm saying? Like they're very controlling and manipulative and they definitely always have to be the center of attention. They're very envious of other people as well. Like they'll think, why does this person have that when I actually deserve it? Okay. Um, interestingly, these people, people that have this psychological disorder are normally very successful people mm. because they're so driven and they're so, um, it's so important to them how other people see them. Okay. So that's really important, I think, to keep in mind about Kathy as the story progresses. So in September of 1986, just a couple months after her and Ken divorced, this newly single Kathy meets and begins a romantic relationship with another nurse, another nurse's aide at Alpine Manor named Gwen. Mm. Gwen was new to Michigan and had just recently gotten the job at the nursing home. And um, she grew up Gwendolyn Graham. She was born in 1963 in California. When she was in fifth grade, her family moved to Texas and lived on a farm. Gwen's parents were reported to be very cold, like crazy cold. Her mom had this belief that if you held infants, it would make them weak. Oh, no. So, yeah. So she grew up really lacking like that. Um, affection and, mm. you know, these things that the kids we know now, kids really have to have in order to thrive, and especially in their younger years. Her father was also reported to be physically and sexually abusive to her. And Gwen started showing these self-harming behaviors as mm. a result of the way that she grew up. So she would do things like uh, burn herself with cigarettes. She would cut herself with razor blades and um, just had all these scars and um, things on her arms and on her body. Super, super sad. Okay. Gosh, yeah. So fast forward to Gwen a little bit. She was actually later diagnosed with a psychological disorder called borderline personality disorder. Mm. Okay. So this disorder is um, normally stemming from a very traumatic um, childhood. And during that childhood trauma, the person learns extremely poor coping me mechanisms that are not useful. So like that self-harming behavior that Gwen mm -hmm. had. They have, um, the average person with this disorder has uh, crazy mood swings. So this is where you see the depression and the mania, you know, so not a lot in between, just um, swings between those two. They're, they have severe problems with like impulse control. They always feel very overwhelmed. They don't feel validated in their feelings. Like they're not allowed to feel a certain way or it's bad to feel this way. Um, and they have a very high suicide rate, this particular mm -hmm. disorder. It's very sad. It's, it's, um, it's a devastating um, psychological disorder to have, especially if it's not treated. So um, there are treatments for it, but um, if you don't go treat it, it's you have a hard time. Well, so I these, imagine at that time, it's probably not something that was treated that much or even recognized. Yeah, there wasn't even a psychological name for it at the time. Right. So yes, you're absolutely right. So both of these women damaged, you know, sick women find each other. So you can imagine. for each other. Yeah, crazy, crazy plus crazy. Um, and they had started developing this very like toxic inclusive relationship where they um they were obsessed with each other I mean they both just got what they felt like they needed from each other attention and validation and um whether it be the good kind or bad kind they got it and their other friends that you know kind of got them together they really started like distancing themselves from them because they would do crazy stuff like they would like switch patients from one room to another to like confuse the staff and confuse the patients. 
So you've got these like elderly sick patients in this nursing home and they're like, I mean, it's crazy. Like they did crazy stuff. They would call some of the other ladies that were working at the nursing home. They would call their husbands and be like, do you know what your wife is doing right now? Like just to stir stuff up and kind of like she did with her husband. Yeah. Like really crazy, passive aggressive, manipulative stuff. Okay. In the spring of 1987, so this is about 10 months or so after they had gotten together, Gwen all of a sudden up and leaves Michigan and moves back to Texas with another woman. (gasps) So Kathy's like, I don't know. I mean, you know, she just left. She just left me, whatever. And she goes about her life. She continues Hmm. working at the nursing home and, you know, goes on to hang out with her friends, meet other people, whatever. Then in 1988, Ken Wood, her ex-husband, goes to the police and reports that his ex-wife, Kathy, has confessed to him that her and her ex-girlfriend, Gwen, committed multiple murders while they worked together and were dating at the Alpine Manor of patients that were living there during the time of January to April in 1987. What? Sorry. I was waiting to react to that. (laughs) I know. So that's what the police say. They're like, what? This is crazy. So the police look into deaths that took place at the nursing home during this period of time between January and April of 1987. And they find that there has been, have been 40 deaths at this nursing home, but none of the deaths were listed as suspicious. And there was no increase in deaths during this period of time. So like if you took a normal rate, it's an, at a normal rate. So if you took like the four months prior, they had a similar 40 deaths four months prior to that, four months after that. So there's absolutely nothing that looks suspicious about this. So they think Ken is crazy. Is he lying? Is he for some reason seeking revenge against Kathy? Mm -hmm. I will answer those questions right after this break. So the police's first step in their process is to bring Miss Kathy Wood in for questioning. So Kathy comes in and they ask her about these allegations that her ex-husband has made against her. And she first claims that the entire story that she told to Ken was just a big joke. Oh, yeah. I joke about that stuff all the time. (laughs) I like kill people. In in detail with dates. Mm -hmm. All right. Um, After a while of the questioning, (laughs) a while like 30 minutes, she then begins to tell the police the story that she did indeed know of murders that did take place at Alpine Manor to the patients there. However, she claims that her ex-girlfriend Gwen is a very sick and dark woman. And that she made up a game called the murder game. I play a murder game, actually, currently during quarantine, (laughs) but it's a trivia game. Oh, really? (laughs) Yeah. It's called this. The murder room. (laughs) Oh, really? You have to look that up. Um, This is not a trivia game. (laughs) I didn't think so. This is a game in which the object of the game is to kill people whose first initials spell the name murder. (gasps) I have heard this. You have? No, no. So, do you do you ever watch American Horror Story? Um, yes. Okay, so it's one of the plots. Oh, <gasps> they stole it. Yeah, this is they like one of the stole plots. it from Michigan. I'm oh, fairly certain that. that's where I've heard this before. Anyway, okay, okay. <laughs> so Kathy claims that Gwen is the absolute mastermind in this game, and that she only served as a lookout 
while Gwen committed these murders against these patients and says that Gwen convinced her or coerced her to look out for her while she goes into the room of these patients and smothers them with a washcloth. Oh my goodness. Okay. So she claims that the first victim was in January of 1987 and was an elderly lady who had Alzheimer's. She's not that elderly, though. She was 60 years old, and her name was Marguerite Chambers. Okay. okay. So there's the M. So then they get to the U and are like, nobody's name starts with the U. Mm -hmm. So that really threw them off. And... They apparently then started picking people who were just too weak to fight back and kind of threw the murder game under the towel, under the washcloth. Oh my gosh. <laughs> oh, my goodness. <laughs> so, they went on to kill four other women. They killed 95-year-old murder Myrtle Lucy, 90, I'm sorry, 79-year-old May Mason, 74-year-old Bell Burke, and then 89-year-old Edith Cook. And that doesn't spell murder. No, no. no. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, they could not yeah. get the U. They could not get the U. <laughs> so then Kathy claims that Gwen completely manipulated her during this time. She would threaten her, and she would even taunt her by walking around the nursing home with the washcloth in her back pocket. And, like, taunt her that, like, oh, today's another day. Oh, my gosh. And then when it came time for Kathy's turn to kill someone, she chickened out. Gwen got angry, found another girlfriend, and moved back to Texas. Huh. So they had Kathy take a polygraph test. And Kathy botched the polygraph test. Mm. Like, she failed big time. So the polygrapher actually says this whole story is made up. Like the whole thing is a hoax. None of this is true. She lied about literally everything. That's quite um, a story to make up. It is. You're right. Which so, I mean, I guess could happen, but still, like, I don't know. That'd be quite detailed. Indeed. So the police obtained records um, at the nursing home of the five nursing home patients that were claimed to have been the murder victims. None of these five victims had autopsies because you just don't like you go to a nursing home because you're old or you're old. I mean, that's why you go and they and suffocated them. Right. So, right? right. Yeah. So that, allegedly. I mean, yeah, allegedly that probably wouldn't, you know, I mean, they could have just died of natural causes and you wouldn't have been suspicious of that. They are. They're all listed yeah. as natural causes. Um, cardiac arrest, you know, heart attack, oh, cardiac arrest. I don't know if you like, that's like such a global way. Mm -hmm. It's literally the way of saying that someone died of natural cause. Like my grandmother died of cardiac arrest. She was 96 years old and fell asleep. Right. But that's what they listed as. So like mm -hmm. that is a very generic thing. Three of these patients, three of the five patients, were cremated. Yeah, well. So they were able to obtain records from the nursing home and did show that both women were working at the time that all five of these deaths occurred. Mm. They also found records of this report that this elderly man had made that he had actually been attacked by one of the nurses there, by them putting something over his face, and apparently was able to fight them off. But at the time, like this man apparently suffered from pretty severe dementia, and it's not uncommon, I think, for patients to hallucinate or, I don't know, I don't know why you would hallucinate somebody's attacking you in your bed, but, you know, they kind of wrote him off at yeah. the time. But the police found that very interesting, and they thought, man... Maybe they tried to kill more people. So then they interview the staff of the nursing home and Kathy and Gwen's friends, all of which claim that Kathy was 100% the 
the manipulative dominant person in their relationship. And they describe Gwen as a low functioning person. Mm. So I don't really know what that means actually, but I know what a low functioning borderline personality is. And it is definitely the person who is being manipulated for sure. Okay. So this is not at all Kathy's story, right? So the next step is the Michigan police traveled to Texas to interview Gwen. Gwen is there living with her current girlfriend that she left Kathy for and tells a totally different story than Kathy and claims that this whole thing is made up. She has no idea what she's talking about. There were no murders ever committed. If they were ever committed, she had no knowledge of them. Kathy did them on her own. Maybe I was there. Maybe I was working. I don't know anything about them. Hmm. This is not something that we did together. It is not something that we planned. I don't know any of these people. I have no clue what she's talking about. She says that Kathy is mean. She is sick. She is manipulative. She is dominating and she's abusive. And that the reason why she left Michigan all of a sudden is because she feared for her life after Kathy tied her up during a sexual act, threatened her with a gun, and told her that she was going to kill her if she ever left. (laughs) So she fled. (laughs) Basically, that's her story. So she took a polygraph, which came back inconclusive. I really hate to even, like, report on these polygraphs because... Like, do people even do polygraphs anymore? Oh, they do. And then everybody, especially in true crime, get all pissed off because it's like it can't be used in court and you just end up failing because it's nerves or whatever. I mean, because that's what it's picking up on. So you could just be nervous of the fact that you were asked to do one and fail it. (laughs) So I feel like people just get mad at people for doing them anyways. I know. There's no weight to them. So, like, I don't even know. But, you know, just reporting the facts here. Yeah. So the police are like, WTH, like, (laughs) (laughs) what is going on here in Michigan? So they confront Kathy again. And they tell Kathy the story that Gwen tells them. And like, somebody's lying. Both of you are lying. We don't know what's going on. Ken is lying. You're lying. Gwen's lying. Like, we don't know what's going on here. So Kathy then admits that she was, in fact, a part of the killings, more so than she was before. And she admits to coming up with this murder game with Gwen and, you know, that the killings were planned, that they did talk about them together, and but that she didn't do them. She was only the lookout. She never committed any of them. But she does admit that she got, type, like, a thrill from them. Mm. And that her and Gwen would grow closer and closer with each murder. And that after the murders were committed, they would sneak away to an empty room and get it on. Empty room of somebody they just murdered? No, like an empty room, I think. (laughs) I don't know about that. but And they had this little, like, saying. And they would write notes to each other that said... I love you forever and so many days. And like the so many days was how many victims they had. Oh, so it was like, I love you forever in two days after their second victim, or I love you forever in four days or whatever. (sighs) Okay. But again, she claims that she was lookout. She didn't do them. It was all Gwen. Right. Oh, So the police, I mean, at this point, have no choice but to exhume the bodies of the two buried victims. Oh, because the others were cremated. (sighs) Right, because the others were cremated. And the two bodies that were buried and not cremated that they exhumed poetically were their first victim and their last. So it was Marguerite Chambers and Edith Cook. So they exhumed the bodies, they perform an autopsy, and they found 
No evidence of homicide. No evidence of smothering. Okay. So well, I looked I'm... it up. Okay. Oh, okay, good. Then you're probably going to answer, answer the question I'm going to have. Go. <laughs> <laughs> is your question like, what is that? What is the evidence of smothering? Yes, because how, I mean, that would just be somebody stopping, like, if they suffocated them, they just stopped breathing. So couldn't they have just stopped breathing? I mean, unless they inhaled, I guess, a particle of the washcloth or whatever. <laughs> okay. <laughs> but... There are There is some evidence. Um, one is bloodshot eyes. Mm -hmm. One is high levels of carbon dioxide in the blood. Um, bruising or marks around the nose and mouth and or throat because a lot of suffocation comes from that. The fractured hyoid bone and those types of things are more a sign of choking, mm -hmm. that type of asphyxiation. Um, and then any fibers or hairs, like you said, from the washcloth or whatever instrument was used to smother them. Okay. These people have been dead for years mm -hmm. and they're bones. So like they don't have eyes, they don't have blood, they don't have skin. <laughs> there is literally no way to test for this. Mm -hmm. So they cannot confirm or deny the cause of death. However, hold on to your seat. Okay, I'm ready. This kills me. Based on Kathy's account of the deaths of these two women, they changed the cause of death on the death certificate to homicide. They couldn't so. prove it. They just took Kathy's word for it. Yes. I mean, like, calling all forensic people out there. What the heck? Yeah. When does that happen in real life? Like, no evidence. I don't know. I can't no even think of it. physical evidence. But because they were able to change the cause of death to homicide, they were then able to issue arrest warrants for Kathy and Gwen. Who are both blaming each other. Who are both blaming each other. So these two women were both arrested in December of 1988. Kathy takes a plea deal mm, to testify against Gwen. And she is charged with one count of second degree murder for the murder of Marguerite Chambers and one count of conspiracy to commit murder mm. with Edith Cook. She is sentenced to 20 years on each count. So 40 years total. So she, okay. she takes that. She's like, I'm guilty of that. I did that. I don't have to go to trial. Put me in jail. I'll tell you whatever you want. Okay. Gwen is arrested and charged with five counts of first degree murder. Five. How does she? How? <laughs> I know the other three were cremated, but how come? What's her name didn't get? In on that action. I don't understand. <laughs> because they can they only have two bodies. Neither one of which showed I can't. I can't. Right. But, this, like, so then how are they charging her with the three that were cremated if they don't they can't even change their death certificate, can they? Or did they just change it for them too? No. Just <laughs> no. I mean because Kathy said, you know? <sighs> okay. So, Kathy testifies against her in trial. Okay. Here's the shocker. <laughs> the next. The next shocker. Here's the shock. Um, <laughs> yeah. I've been shocked this whole time. <laughs> right. Gwen's new girlfriend also testifies against her in court, saying that Gwen also confessed all five murders to her. Like, oh. literally tells the exact same story that Kathy tells to the jury. Mm. Gwen continues to claim her innocence. She is, this girl, is, like, ripped apart in court by literally everyone. By Kathy, by 
her girlfriend, they bring up her psychological issues and her disorder and all of the reasons why psychologically she could have committed these murders. And they don't bring up Kathy's. Mm. Because Kathy's not on trial, remember? Okay. So, not shockingly, in November of 1989, Gwen is found guilty of five counts of murder and one count of conspiracy to commit murder, and she is sentenced to six life sentences without the possibility of parole. And the other one got 40 years. 40 years. Mm. Okay, there's no... (gasps) Wait, we're coming up. I'm 40. Hold it. Put 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 it down. <laughs> Sorry. Put it Sorry. down the phone. <laughs> okay. So, I mean, let's just real quick, though. There's no scientific evidence whatsoever to convict anyone mm-hmm. or even believe that there isn't even any murder. And there's no forensic evidence. Nothing. Literally, this is all based on what Kathy told Ken, what Kathy told the police, what Kathy potentially told Gwen's girlfriend. All Mm. of it. Mm -hmm. Now. And, I mean, it's just literally all based on Kathy's testimony. And then, you know, they had some, like, testimonies from the co-workers who were like, yeah, they were crazy. They would do crazy things. But it was all Kathy. So, convicted Mm. this woman. Mm -hmm. So, she is currently being held in a Michigan state prison she still claims her innocence claims that she has absolutely no idea where the story even came from that kathy Kathy. was crazy oh no gwen is saying that gwen yeah gwen is still saying she's in michigan and she's still saying like i literally i got i got nothing like i don't know what she's talking about kathy a few years into her sentence was transferred to a prison in florida and here you go. In January of 2020, she was released from prison after serving 30 years. She's 57. 57. Oh She's and living she, in the villages. She lives in Fort Mill, South Carolina with her oh. sister. What? Yes. They let her leave the state of Florida. Why did she get transferred to Florida, first of all? That's a great question, actually. I don't know the answer to that question, and I tried to find that, and I don't know, but it was shady. Mm -hmm. (laughs) I can tell you that. I don't know. I mean, you go from Michigan to Florida. I I feel like, I don't know, go to Michigan to Wisconsin or Michigan to, I don't know, somewhere else closer. I mean, I do feel like you can put in for transfers for various types of reasons due to, um, I don't know. I know she got mental health counseling Mm. while she was in Mm. prison, and I literally have no idea. Like, I can't even speak to it. I could not find one freaking thing about it. Mm. But I do know there are reasons. Sometimes it's due to the prisoner's safety. Sometimes it's due to their treatment. Sometimes it's because they have family closer to that prison. I think there's a lot of reasons why people get transferred. I do not know. Mm -hmm. But her parole actually ends in June of 2021. So, like, she's out. She's free. She's on parole. But as of June of next year, she is literally like this 50, you know, late 50s woman who is just like going about life. Nobody's and keeping remember, track of her. Well, her sister, I well, guess. I'm saying legally <laughs> nobody has to keep track of her after 2021. All right. Yes, mm. exactly. Yeah. She's, I mean, as long as she doesn't violate her parole, mm. she's gone. And I saw this interview, and this is super, super sad. It was with her daughter, Jackie, who was eight when the when her mom was arrested. And she, apparently she did go and, like, visit her mom while she was in Michigan. But, like, as she got to be, like, a teenager or whatever, her mom then got transferred to Florida, and she couldn't go and visit her. But, like... Gosh, it was a sad interview. I mean, she just was talking about how, like, you know, she's with her dad, who was like, you know, it's like a daughter and a dad, and they struggled, and she suffers from a lot of mental illness as well, and depression, and like, you know, just these like feelings that your mom left you and like is in prison, and you know, like, mm. it was sad. It was just sad to like hear her story and see this like beautiful girl who 
just has this history that, you know, there's nothing she can do about, but it's like so stamped into who she is as a person. Mm. So I will leave you with this. Is Kathy telling the truth? Was she truly like a part of these awful murders on these helpless elderly people? And just the guilt got to her and she came clean. Is Gwen a monster that, you know, she says she is that planned these murders? Or is Kathy a monster? And she got mad at Gwen for leaving her for another woman and literally sacrificed her own freedom just to get revenge. Mm, Like they didn't do this. And she just made up the whole thing. She made up the whole thing. Because she was pissed. Because she was pissed. That I is next level. <laughs> <laughs> so there you go. What do you think? Um, one, Kathy is crazy. And they're I They're would... both crazy. They're fair. both crazy. Be fair. They're both crazy. Ah. Uh, You've now just planted seeds in my head because initially I was just like, well, yes, of course, clearly they did this. But now I don't know. Maybe I, I, I feel like she has lied enough in her past to other people about people in her life that she would make this lie up because she's that pissed at Gwen. And so manipulative and controlling <gasps> that she's like, I am going to mess with her life. Even though she is not even with me. Even though she's in Texas. Right. Oh. I would also like to put in a motion to now, from this day forth, change all Karens to Kathy. Because, <laughs> man, she's some crazy, crazy, next level crazy. I think it's interesting because, like, as a true crime fan and you know me I'm like a huge like I'm very psychological when it comes to my way of thinking of everything but it's like what where do you go do you go with the forensic scientific side or the conspiracy that side you know what I mean like right except the forensic scientific side went with whatever somebody said true there is literally no evidence there is no forensic or, I mean, well, I mean, I guess there is in terms of there isn't any forensic evidence that there was a crime. Right. They That's died. The forensic evidence. But even those guys were like, okay, well, but she said she killed him. So we'll just say you know, that she did. <laughs> I, but that's actually not true. There were, um, like one of the guys who was in charge of the case who I watched a documentary on this case and he was interviewed quite a few times on it. And he definitely was like, uh, it was Kathy. Kathy is crazy he Mm. believes however that kathy was the um person who murdered all these people Mm -hmm. so he did believe that she was capable of murder and that she just framed gwen for this but so again he doesn't he believes they were murdered right like like, that's a story that's a story. Like, you're coming up with names. You're coming up with dates. You're coming up with, like, the murder game and the, and the little notes that you created. Like, if it was made up, who does? Like, for real. May my children never learn to lie like Kathy would because oh that my is gosh. a story. Yeah, and then she gets American Horror Story to basically portray that. I mean, she's living the dream. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah, in Fort Mill, South Carolina with her sister. Huh. You better drive down there and give Kathy a piece of your mind. No, I (laughs) want her to know I'm doing this podcast. Lord. (laughs) (laughs) Okay. Oh, my gosh. Wow. Wow. That was crazy. A good that one, right? Not- and and I just would like to point out too that technically, sh- since these women were convicted, or at least one of the women was convicted of five murders, it is considered a serial killer. Oh, our first serial killer case. So there's our foot in the door. All kinda. right, just kinda. There's some on my list. 
I'm just, <laughs> I'm just tickled with the with the threshold. Yes. Yeah. 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 Mm. I'm easing us in. Very interesting. Very mm-hmm. interesting. Mm-hmm. Oh my gosh. Oh, well, gosh, that I don't even know what to say to all of that, but um you guys just let that ponder for just a minute. <laughs> let us know what you think. <laughs> yes, please let us know what you think. Always let us know what you think. We love to hear what you think. Um, and we always want to thank you for listening. We'd love to hear from you. Feel free to leave us a review, rate us. Actually, review. <laughs> we like <laughs> yes, the reviews. Please. It helps us so much. It does. It does. I know we say it a lot and we always emphasize it, but for real, it helps us a lot. Um, if you have any questions or anything, reach out to us on Instagram, Facebook, send us an email, crimesandclosets at gmail.com. Find us on our website, crimesandclosets.com. It's my baby. <laughs> yes. Um, you know, just reach out to us. We will answer. We promise. We have nothing else to do. <laughs> so, anyway, uh, and always remember the world is scary, people suck. Hide in your closets. See you next week.